what up YouTube Bonza here back with another video uh, this is gonna be the part 2 to my Solomon Islands China pack security deal video uh, I did the part 1 a while back I know it was about a month ago I'm sorry but anyway <laughs> better late than never right to release this video so basically in that previous video I covered the historical context uh, that and I laid the groundwork for why Solomon Islands has the issues that it has, at least from a historical perspective, that would necessitate it to have the kind of security pact that it did with China, as well as, um, for those of you who don't know, the one that it already has with Australia. And so uh, I laid the groundwork and I just gave the historical context for why that was. Uh, in this video, I'm going to focus more on the more current events and the current state of Solomon's Islands, as well as the things that led up to the, uh, the pact itself and, of course, the aftermath of the pact itself. So specifically, I'm going to be talking about it in terms of the following topics. Uh, one, we'll go over the current state of the Solomon Islands. Two, we'll talk about the Solomon Islands Prime Minister Sogobar's fourth uh, term, his fourth election to become Prime Minister in 2019. Three, we'll talk about the pact itself. Uh, as I mentioned in the previous video, we don't really know much about it because they didn't release much information, but I'll say what we can speculate it entails and also mention a bit about how it has been compared to the pact Solomon Islands already has with Australia. Uh, four and five is basically going to be us talking about firstly the reaction of the Solomon Islanders themselves to the security pact and finally we'll talk about the reaction of the greater Pacific community as well as the world more specifically the West's reaction to the Solomon Islands doing this deal with China. So yeah that seems like a lot but uh, I'm going to be breezing through a lot of these, especially because I've laid a lot of the groundwork already and so it's just going to be, be me filling uh, you guys in on the more recent uh, state of things so that we can talk about the pack and give it all like uh, the recent context. So anyway, with that out of the way, let's get into the rest of this video and we're going to start by talking about the current state of the Solomon Islands. Okay, so as the title suggests, in this section, I'm just going to be talking about the current state of the Solomon Islands. And I'll mainly be going over two specific factors that I feel like play a major role here in setting up the instability in the Solomon Islands. So first up, we're going to talk about the growing youth problem. So the Solomon Islands, like many other third world countries in the world, has a large growing young population coming into the working age but they don't have a lot of economic opportunities being made uh, to meet this growing population. And so you have a lot of instability now resulting from this. Uh, the obvious ones that you could probably think of is like, you know, crime and uh, people resorting to less uh, scrupulous activities. And obviously there's just a general depreciation of labor cost, right, which, you know, for business side, it's good for them, but obviously for the young people themselves, because their efforts are worthless, they're not making a lot of money, and so life is harder for them. That's for the ones who actually try to do it the legal way. And so you have a lot of dis dissatisfaction there. And thus, whenever protests arise, a lot of these individuals, these young individuals, are more likely to hop into the, pro uh, into the protests because they're dissatisfied and can riot and cause a lot of issues, which is something that a lot of politicians in the Solomon Islands commonly point out. Uh, I found a nice video about this topic by the ABC, and I'm just going to play a few brief clips from it to highlight what I'm talking about. Riots in Honiara's Chinatown last November were broadly blamed on disaffected youth. There's only 4,000 jobs in this country every year. And there's 18,000 graduates coming out from overseas, from universities. I completed three years of studying and found it was difficult to find a job. My biggest challenge as a young person is resisting the temptation to go out drinking with friends. That's why I try to come here to the courts in the weekends. So, as that clip suggests, uh, you can even see there's a young gentleman there that even straight up said that he has to, you know, force himself to go down to the basketball court to you know, have fun and keep his mind off his worries so that he doesn't resort to, you know, in his case he said drinking, but obviously, you know, people drink and they're more likely to go out and do 
things like uh, steel and so on like that so you know kudos to that young man but obviously not every individual is going to strong will as he is to keep themselves on the right track so whenever the protests do arise uh, you can see here uh, there's a lot of people causing issues there and once again a lot of the problems that arise are being blamed on young men a lot of you know young individuals who don't have a lot of jobs um, and so there's a lot of finger pointing you can see here at the youth population but also i think it's worth pointing out that you know they're doing all this for a reason right and uh, in the same bbc video i showed you earlier uh, there was a young entrepreneur who made a very valid appointment regarding what she thinks the government's approach should be it frustrates me that you know a solution is to arm our police force you know, that's not a solution. That will never be a solution for Solomon Islands. We should be prioritizing economic prospects for our young people, and that means agriculture. That means investing more in our arts. Finding a way for, for us to export. And so, yeah, basically what she's saying is that, you know, if the government instead focused on creating uh, infrastructure and pr providing opportunities to these young individuals, a lot of them wouldn't have the result to, you know, going into violent protests because they wouldn't be as dissatisfied with the government, which is a good point. So kudos to her for saying that. Nevertheless, the growing youth population for the time being is quite the issue for the current government. Now, the next thing I'd like to point out is the deteriorating relationship between the central government of the Solomon Islands and its provincial governments. I'm sure you can understand the issues between the Malaitan province especially and the central government, given the tensions history that I went over. However, it's not just the Malaitans that take issue with the central government, but actually a lot of the other provinces also take issues with some of the actions the Solomon Islands government has been taking, the central government that is, towards centralizing power and strengthening themselves. A lot of the provincial governments have um, new leadership, so they have visions for their province that they want to fulfill, um, and they're being more vocal about that. And Malaita is the most extreme example of that. Each other province apart from Malaita has their own reasons for wanting to do this and I found quite a lot of mentions of this throughout my research. Again, this is because of how the central government has been strengthening its power over recent years. The other side of the coin here is that the government, central government has been saying that it's doing this to increase its efficiency and allow it to make decisions that would best benefit the country as a whole. However, however you can see based on for example, this document that I'm showing once again, where the Western Provinces Premier straight up sued the central government after they tried to do something, uh, you can tell that there's not a lot of faith from the provincial governments towards the central government in this area. And as such, that means that these provincial governors, one being ambitious and wanting to do the best for their province, will often prefer to maintain some powers and some level of autonomy so they can, from what they're saying, do the best that they can do to serve their people. Thus, you have this unstable situation between the central government and the provincial governments forming another piece of the puzzle towards the current state of the Solomon Islands. So, next up, we're going to look at the election of Manasseh Sogovare into his fourth term as Prime Minister in 2019. So, in 2019, Manasseh Sokovare was elected to his fourth term as Prime Minister of the Solomon Islands. And, surprise, surprise, it did not go as smoothly as he would have hoped. Firstly, uh, the actual vote itself did not go without some controversies. The vote he won for his fourth term had 15 abstentions out of a total of 50 in the parliament and most of the people who abstained were supporters of a rival candidate named Matthew Wale. Matthew Wale had in fact filed a court injunction to postpone the election. Uh, I tried looking into this honestly and to be honest I couldn't really figure out uh, find out what the clear reason was behind the court injunction but basically when it turns out that the governor general wouldn't listen to the court injunction uh, Wale and the rest of his supporters opted to abstain from voting and so they didn't attend when the 
vote for the Prime Minister had to take place. And so the 35 remaining, out of the 35 remaining, 34 voted for Manasta Sumuvara and there was one incorrectly marked. But basically a bit of controversy there from the get-go uh, at the actual election of the Prime Minister itself. Now, once he was officially elected, there was another round of protests throughout the Solomon Islands, especially in the capital, of course. Hundreds of police had to be deployed to the capital in order to try to quell the dissent. During these protests of Sogobar, there were even already a lot of targeted attacks towards Chinese businesses uh, along the streets and as well as the surrounding streets of uh, the Chinatown in Honiara. And there were a lot of young men involved in this uh, protest, shouting a lot of slogans and throwing a lot of objects at property, damaging quite a lot of property Egypt, uh, during this time. Oh, and by the way, this was all before the Solomon Islands made the diplomatic switch from Taiwan to China. In the end, a lot of property was damaged, uh, especially a lot of Chinese old businesses. And again, I'm using the term Chinese here loosely, basically including Taiwanese businesses in that. And yeah, it was uh, quite the big story when this happened in the Solomon Islands in 2019. Eventually though, things would come down and the rioters would disperse. But, as you can see, it was not a good start for Sogovare on his fourth turn. Anyway, with that, we're going to move on now to talk about the pact itself. Uh, again, this part is going to be very brief, not as long as I would have wanted it to be, but anyway, I'm just going to highlight uh, some of the things we know about the actual pact between the Solomon Islands and China. Okay, so now, the pact itself. Now, the announcement of the pact itself is actually very suspicious because it only came about because of a leaked draft of the pact that was leaked on social media in March 22 of this year, 2022. Now, this draft was later confirmed by the Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Wenban on the 19th of April and that was later also confirmed on the Solomon Islands side by uh, their Foreign Affairs Minister as well. Jeremiah Manale. So you have this situation where it's almost as if if that leaked draft didn't leak, you might not have even known about this. Maybe at least until much later on. But anyway, the leak got out and people became aware and suspicious. So already quite a lot of eyes were drawn to this act. Now, it's important to remember that this was a draft of the pact and not the final draft. So we don't know how much changed between that draft and the final pact that was eventually signed. Now, we don't know exactly what is contained within a pact because no official documents regarding the details of the pact have been released. Uh, this is somewhat suspicious because with the Australian security pact with the Solomon Islands, for example, you can actually just go on the internet and look up the specific details of what is contained within that security pact. So that's why a lot of people are quite suspicious about this particular pact with China. Why aren't they willing to share it with the rest of us? That said, the Solomon Islands PM himself has expressed some of the details of the pact. And three of the important ones that he has said are the following. One, the Solomon Islands will supervise these Chinese police forces that are deployed to the island. Two, none of these police forces will be given firearms when they come into the country so there aren't a lot of gun violence in the solomon islands for example so as such there really is no need for guns for this police force and that's why it's expressly stated by the pm that they won't have guns and three there are no plans whatsoever to expand this deal any further than what he previously mentioned so that obviously entails that there will be no plans to expand to include a military base within the Solomon Islands. That said, a lot of the Western uh, nations that are watching, you know, Australia especially and America, uh, are very concerned about that last part, uh, about the truthfulness of it. And so, and obviously without the specific document to show, um, some people will still hold their reservation in that regard. 
I'll get more into the western reaction of this when I talk about it uh, later on in this video. As for the Solomon Islands Prime Minister himself, he has consistently stated that he is uh, in fact insulted by the insinuation by a lot of these Western nations that he would ever allow a foreign nation, be that China or even Australia, build a military base in the Solomon Islands. He says that will never happen. Goodness! We're insulted! We have no intention, Mr. Speaker, of pitching into any geopolitical power struggle. To suggest it, Mr. Speaker, is simply ludicrous. We find it very insulting, Mr. Speaker, to be branded as unfit to manage our sovereign affairs or have other motives in pursuing our national interests. He has stated firmly on multiple occasions that the Solomon Islands is a friend to all and enemies to none. This has been his and his government's official stance on the matter. So to briefly summarize, the pact will, at least according to PM Sogovare, allow for the deployment of Chinese police personnel to help quell local dissent. These police will come under the direction of the Solomon Islands police force once they arrive and thus ultimately answer to the Solomon Islands government. They will be a demilitarized force, hence no firearms. Lastly, from the PM, uh, we know that he has no plans to expand this pact but of course, you know, we have the, the Western countries especially who are somewhat suspicious because of the lack of transparency towards the pact itself. Okay guys, so I'm going to put a pause here and I'm going to continue the rest of what I recorded initially in the part 3 of the video. So instead from here on, I'm going to fast forward to the conclusion part of everything that I've already talked about. And the rest of the parts, the part 4 and the part 5 of this video where I talk about the public reaction I'll do in a part 3 to this series. Okay, so that was a very long discussion and we're finally on to the conclusion part of this video. So I just decided to do one big takeaway for this whole video and so I'm just gonna quickly you know go over everything just like quickly uh, mention the main things and just uh, summarize it all. So yeah, let's go over them in order of the topics in which I covered them. So firstly, the current state of the Solomon Islands. Uh, as I've already given you the history, you know that um, there's a lot of instability from the previous history of the Solomon Islands that would make it a bit unstable. But then in the current era, you have an economic state that is very unfavorable, right? You have the large growing young population that is coming into the workforce but there's not enough job opportunities for them and so you have a lot of disenfranchised youths that can result to crime and cause a lot of other issues but they can also go into protests and civil disobedience because of their dissatisfaction with the way things currently are in their country and rightly so right you also have a central government that's trying to pull together the nation and wrestle some control over so they can you know at least from what they're saying, enact policies that will more effectively manage things in the countries. But then you have a lot of pushback to that central government from the provincial governments who don't trust them for various reasons, corruption, accusations, and so on. And so you have these um, tensions, more or less, between the central government and a lot of these other provincial governments uh, vying for control in the country itself together with the underlying poverty and other issues that you would usually see in small third world countries, you have a very unstable nation in its current state. As for the Prime Minister himself, I already gave you a lot of his history, but basically it's based on that history and a lot of the decisions that he's made recently, I think it's understandable why there will be a large section of the Somalian's population that will not have a lot of faith in their current Prime Minister. Coupled with his recent decisions to end diplomatic ties with Taiwan and switch to China, uh, and it's not that the previous relationship between the SI government and Taiwan did not have any suspicions of their own, 
But that said, they did bring benefits, and so cutting off that ties, those ties certainly would have an impact. And then he replaces the ties with Taiwan with China. And China, you know, despite doing a lot of good in the world in some respects, does not necessarily have a lot of good reputation because of a lot of other things that they've done. And I won't mention those here, not for any particular reasons, but because that's a different topic. I um, just want to stay focused on the Solomon Islands. But yeah, China doesn't necessarily have the best reputation either, and then he switches to them. And then now he creates this security pact with that same very nation. And so ultimately you have a lot of distrust from the people, from his previous history, and now from his recent uh, decisions. And this will obviously result in a lot of the protests and the riots that happened during his uh, first election and throughout his prime ministership. And then now you have another announcement from Sobobaira and the central government that they're going to be delaying the next general election for the Solomon Islands. It's supposed to happen in 2023, but they're going to postpone it another year because they want to focus on the Pacific Games, which, you know, is a valid reason, I guess, in some respects. But then there's a lot of people who argue that based on the way his prime ministership is gone, it's probably likely or there's probably a good chance that he won't be re-elected or his party will lose out. And thus, this is just their way of holding on to power again. But this is coming from their rivals, basically. And so, yeah, a lot of Sokovare's decisions recently have not necessarily painted him in the best light and that's why it seems pretty easy for his rivals at least to paint him in a very negative picture. So thirdly you have the pact itself which has still not yet been made transparent fully to the public as of when this video was released. So when we sort of look back and tally all of the issues in the Solomon Islands you have you know some of the tensions and the histories of the far past and then you have the new rising problem with the population and a lot of the underlying issues that of like uh, third world countries not being able to you know provide a lot of economic opportunities and then you have a central government that's not trusted by either the people or the provincial governments you have a prime minister who doesn't have the best reputation and then you have him making very questionable moves as of late with a questionable foreign partner and specifically now they've made a security pact with that foreign partner that's going to allow that foreign partner to deploy forces within their nation to quell dissent okay guys so yeah unfortunately i'm going to have to put a cut in this part of my solomon islands china pack video because as i was editing i realized that it was going on too long and i didn't want to have this video go beyond 30 minutes so basically uh the part four and five where i talk about the solomon islands people's reaction to the pack as well as the world's reaction to the pack will be covered in a separate video on its own but as for now i'm going to leave off the video as it is so I'd like to take this time to thank you for watching this video and I hope you learned something from it. If so, please like the video. If you're looking forward to part 3, you can go ahead and subscribe to my channel. Uh, I mostly do a lot of other videos, mostly gaming videos and movie reviews on this channel. So if you want to check out other content from me too, you can subscribe and check out my other content. Otherwise, thank you so much for uh, checking out this video. I hope you guys are looking forward to part 3. And with that, this is Bonsai, signing out. Catch you all later.